Joining us now on the Boardwalk on the Hotline to talk some more NFL, Vinny Iyer of the Sporting News. You can follow him on Twitter at Vinny Iyer. Vinny, how are you doing on this Monday night? Good. How's it going, guys? Doing pretty good. So I, I wanted to start out, obviously we've talked about a lot about the Eagles. And I want to touch on that first, and that is, from my perspective, Vinny, it feels more and more like one of the things that's really missing from this football team, specifically on the offense, is the fact that you have a team that's scoring six less points a game than last year. You look at the Colts. You look at the Vikings. You're seeing plays that the Eagles were running last year as Reich and DeFilippo took those concepts with them to their new locations, and it looks like that the loss of those two coaches have had a much bigger impact on the Eagles than people previously predicted. Yeah, I mean, some teams lose a lot of key players, and they did lose a few guys. Uh, Patrick Robinson they could really use, obviously, in the secondary. Now they're not as deep on the defensive line. There were some changes, but overall the biggest loss was uh, the two coaches there. And just really the influence it's sometimes there's the play calling that is the be all end all some of it is the play design and i think that's where reich and uh, d Filippo were so involved in this offense that they were using the players as best as possible really knowing how to cater to their strengths being able to work with them on the positional level and understand the concepts that this the team could be successful at. So that's where uh, Doug Peterson's missing that because it's hard to oversee a team and uh, do the big picture stuff and also operate your offense at a high level. Last year he had a good brain trust in place. I'm not saying they're not capable this year with their coaching staff, but those two guys are special for a reason. I mean, you look at Kirk Cousins. I know he's had some troubles with turnovers, but DeFilippo has had a great influence on him in uh, making more efficient, having one of his better seasons in the NFL. And then you look at Frank Reich, uh, probably has already guided Andrew Luck to his best overall season in the NFL. So when you look at that, I think all the, the mojo of that has been gone. The creativity that we used to see with uh, Doug Peterson and the staff are gone. And uh, that's what you're left with, a team that really can't run, doesn't have too many receivers that scare anybody. You know, with Alex Smith now out for the year with his broken leg and the Eagles lost to the Saints, who who is really the favorite in the NFC East? Vinny, at this point, I mean, I if if you had to force me to pick a team, I I guess I would lean the Cowboys. How do you how do you see the NFC East shaping up right now? Well, I think uh, the Cowboys are the team with the least question marks at this point. You know, kind of what they are. They're a very strong defensive team. They've really improved their secondary. They're really good against the run. Ben, don't break. They're not going to dominate you, but they're going to keep things in front like the Falcons game. Uh, really let Julio Jones do his thing, but nobody else really burned them, and that allowed them to stay in the game until the Cowboys could get going offensively. And you see Ezekiel Elliott, he's really started to crank here in the last couple of weeks with the running game. Good time of year to do it here in November and de- December. And uh, Dak Prescott, I mean, just Amari Cooper, people were looking at the high price there. But at this point, the Cowboys had to find the easiest way to get a legitimate receiver that was going to draw some attention of defenses. And you see what it is. Amari Cooper does this. All of a sudden, things open up for Jeff Swain, the tight end, and Cole Beasley and uh, Michael Gallup occasionally in some games, and Ezekiel Elliott in the running game. So it just makes defense respect someone else. And it changes the way you defend the Cowboys. Now it's a lot harder to just take Elliott out of the game. Benny, what are your thoughts on how the Eagles have utilized their new supposedly weapon in Golden Tate? I mean, the Eagles bring in Golden Tate a couple weeks ago, and the buzz around this city, everyone covering the team is, you know, hats off to Howie Roseman. He's gearing up. The foot's on the gas. You have this weapon now that can relieve some pressure on the outside receivers, on the inside, on your running game. And this should really be a difference maker in the second half of the season as they make a push for the division and hopefully set themselves up for the playoffs. Through two games now, this new toy that you acquire, I haven't seen any of it. I mean, essentially invisible. Had four catches, I think, uh, yesterday, but essentially meaningless. And in the first game against Dallas, he was barely on the field. So I just want your thoughts on how they use Golden Tate and what the issue is so far. Well, uh, Detroit was uh, soundly criticized for moving him, but he's an older receiver, and he, they were becoming a more running-oriented team, the more outside-throwing team. 
So he was definitely expendable from their standpoint. And what you didn't understand from the Philadelphia standpoint where it was picking up this guy to play the slot because you weren't happy with Nelson Aguilar. Was he going to be the guy that could get those big plays downfield to replace Mike Wallace? We haven't seen really any of that to be a factor in this offense. I think they needed more of just a guy who could stretch the field on the outside. I know we heard the rumors of Deshaun Jackson. That would have been a much better pickup for what this team really needs, the, somebody to – scare the defense and put a shot play, not somebody else to work the underneath routes with uh, Alshon Jeffrey and Zach Ertz and uh, Aglor when he's playing a little bit better. So it's a head-scratching decision because if you're going to pick up a guy like that as a veteran and you think he's going to make a difference, you've got to use him in the right way. And so far, I don't think that's been the case. And I don't know if he was the real issue anyway, getting a player like that. I think they needed – Again, a bigger body or an outside threat, a legitimate one who could play on the outside. They have basically three slot receivers in Aguilar, Jordan Matthews, and Golden Tate. Someone who is being used pretty optimally is Michael Thomas in that Saints offense. And you know, watching Drew Brees, I mean, this guy's playing at an incredible level. And Vinny, one of my beefs about sports in general is that the V in MVP needs to mean something. It's supposed to mean valuable. And Look, nothing against Goff, nothing against Mahomes, but we saw the Chiefs win last year without Mahomes. Yeah, Mahomes hit another level. Yeah, we've seen Sean McVay have other quarterbacks play well in his system, whereas I think without Drew Brees, that Saints team is nothing. So to me, I think that right now for me, Drew Brees should be the leader in the MVP clubhouse. Yeah, to me, I, I just think in the NFL, it's the MVP pretty much comes down to the best player and at this point, he's also the best player right now in the league. So, I mean, whatever you want to define it, uh, if you want to say most valuable or uh, if you want to say the best in the NFL, he's both of those things. I mean, the completion percentage at extremely high rate while throwing downfield, while not turning over the ball. And he's just in zone with these guys. I mean, I look at this offensive line, Michael Thomas, Alvin Kamara, Mark Ingram, This is the best array of weapons Drew Brees has ever had. We've seen him do a lot with the maybe lesser guys that they plugged in, running back committees and Marcus Colston and Lance Moore and those type of players. But these players are a whole different level. And we've seen what he can do when he has these guys. And Traquan Smith, I think, is a legitimate talent as the number two receiver now for this team as well. So that's added another weapon. They've incorporated more guys. It's all because of Brees. He's going to find the open man every time. And the, the Eagles tried to say, okay, we're going to take away Michael Thomas and Alvin Kamara. It didn't work at all against this guy. He just picked up them apart with other guys that uh, maybe no one has heard of. And uh, that's the way Drew Brees is. And I, I think this is good because Tom Brady's having a bit of a struggle here. Aaron Rodgers, it's not been the greatest season. Uh, so when you look at that, Brees is finally maybe getting the credit he deserves to maybe being in the conversation with those guys right now as the best quarterback that we've seen in our in our lifetime speaking of quarterbacks a guy who's having also a phenomenal year he hasn't been sacked for five straight games Vinny. that is andrew luck of the colts i mean talk about how we've been waiting two years for this guy to come back healthy and you combine the fact that they're protecting him the offensive line the fact that you have a gm that's putting legitimate talent on the field for the colts and i think frank reich is getting the best out of this offense it just looks like the Andrew Luck we saw about two, three years ago is finally back. Yeah, definitely. And it really helps. Uh, they really invest in their offensive line. So that was a big deal that everyone complained about this line. But it takes a while. It takes a couple drafts to get those first round level talents. Quentin Nelson was the final piece there. They didn't think in Costanzo and Ryan Kelly and some other good guys. But And then you had to incorporate an offense that said, Let's get Andrew Luck to get the ball out quickly and spread it around and not just sit back there buying time, running around and trying to throw a deep ball and getting taking hits. He's getting the ball out quickly. He's got this uh, multiple tight end offense, which has been his best. If you look back early in his career, that's what he succeeded in most. So all the things, I mean, this is just about knowing your quarterback, knowing his skill set, knowing that he's a sharp mind to survey the field you're not just using him for his big arm, which he still has, but he's just cerebrally ahead of a lot of other quarterbacks. And Frank Reich, he just took a coaching staff to recognize that you can do anything with this guy when he's fully healthy and protect him as well, and you're going to get these type of results. 
Vinny Iyer of the Sporting News joining us on the Boardwalk on the Hotline here on 97.3 ESPN. Every Monday night, we lead you up to Monday Night Football. And Vinny, of course, I have to ask you about tonight's game. Mahomes versus Goff. Hunt versus uh, uh, Gurley. Reed versus McVay. I mean, this is, this is the matchup of all matchups. But yet, is there something about this game that people are overlooking tonight? Well, I, I think we have to look at what defenses are we going to trust at some point because the Saints defense has really come through in a couple of week, couple weeks here with some big plays. Uh, that's what you're looking for. I mean, I know people are looking at the Bears and certain people are trying to attach this dominant defense in the NFL. I just don't think it exists. I think there's defenses that exploit offensive line matchups and all that, but really it comes down to defenses making big plays. So they're going to be able to rush the passer and uh, get turnovers when their offense is putting a lot of pressure on teams. So that's what I want to see in this game. The Chiefs' defense has played a lot better. They haven't played the greatest competition in the world, but they're rushing the passer. They're getting some turnovers. Well, Rams have gone backwards. Aaron Donald, yeah, he can dominate his one little space of the world, but Marcus Peters and the secondary and a lot of the leaks have sprung there in the Rams' defense. So I want to see what team can at least play respectable enough defense to uh, – make us believe that they're going to back up their offense to win a championship. Who's who's the best defense in the NFL right now? Is it is it the Bears? Because, I mean, I know off of one night last night and all the highlights and all the stats NBC was putting on television, you know, some people even walk away and be like, oh, yeah, the Bears are the best. But are they the best? Like, just the whole season as a full picture. Well, I mean, I think they've had different defenses kind of claim that. I think Baltimore at one point had that claim. I think Tennessee going to the Colts game in terms of stats, the way they shut down the run and did some other things, they looked like a defense. I think it's what aspect of your defense you're looking at. And the Bears, it's all about complementary defense. And their complementary defense is darn good because if Mitchell Trubisky and this offense can move the ball a little bit, then it's Khalil Mack time, pressure for these opponents to try to catch up. And you figure the Bears' offense is always going to have a better – matchup than the offense that's facing their defense so that's always in a good spot if you can some, put some pressure on them and uh, throw the ball and uh, have Mitchell Trubisky uh, make some plays here and play with the lead you're putting Khalil Mack in a great position so it's all about knowing the strength of your defense and uh, allowing it to succeed and I think the Bears when you look at all the boxes in terms of uh, being able to rush the passer stop the run have some diversity in playmakers. I, I think they're right up there in the top the three or four in the NFL. Vinny, a couple more for you. Appreciate your time here on Monday as we lead you up to Monday football here on 97.3 ESPN. Coverage begins at 8 o'clock tonight. Staying in the NFC North, if the Packers don't make the postseason, is Mike McCarthy gone? I, I think it already might be the case now. I know, I know the playoffs are, might be a savior but we saw that doesn't even help but Mike Malarkey last year if there's some tensions going on with your ownership or quarterback uh, it's not going to happen here so I think they're just waiting they're not an in-season firing type team they're going to sit back and assess this but they expect to get to the playoffs every year with Aaron Rodgers I know it's a high demand especially when the AFC is is good but last year the excuse of no Rodgers you've had to play Brett Hundley and didn't work out this year, we had Rodgers for the entire season. You invested in your new coordinators, Joe Philbin and Mike Pettin. You, you tried to improve your defense, and uh, you haven't seen the results at all. And uh, I think it's unfortunate for Mike McCarthy because of his success in the past, but it's clear that he's kind of lost touch a little bit with what he wants to do offensively. And uh, and it's hard because they also have a very young roster that we're rebuilding around Aaron Rodgers. So. Maybe their expectations were too great to just plug in Aaron Rodgers and win big this season. Vinny, we saw Lamar Jackson. The guy had one of the more stranger stat lines yesterday. He rushed the ball 27 times. And, you know, I I wanted to look it up and find out, well, you know, when was the last time this happened. I, I wasted about 90 minutes of my life last night doing this research. The only other guys I could find who rushed the ball for about 20 times in the last 50 years in the game are... Tim Tebow, Bobby Douglas, and Billy Kilmer. So, you know, it's just that has to be. We always, we always talk about how we see the sometimes, oh, we see something new every day in the NFL. 
that legitimately was, I think, maybe the first time we've ever had a guy rush that many times in a game in a very long time. And it's crazy to think that in a league that we've had Michael Vick and Randall Cunningham and Steve McNair and Donovan McNabb and even Terrell Pryor start games for the Raiders, that it's Lamar Jackson is the guy who ran 27 times in a game. Yeah, it broke conventional wisdom, but if you look at it, dive into this matchup, the, Ra- the Ravens just said this Bengals team absolutely cannot stop the run. It doesn't matter who we're running out there. This is why Gus Edwards pops out of nowhere from a Rutgers to have a big game because they could just run with anybody for the most part and whoever they wanted to in this game. And they said, all right, well, this is the best game plan. It, it doesn't matter if you had a quarterback who could throw it down the field. If it was Joe Flacco in there, I would try to hand it off several times. So they just extended that to say, okay, our quarterback can run too. That's a, another matchup creator here when the Bengals' run defense has been terrible. And that's kind of what you see in the comments with uh, Marvin Lewis. It was a bit sour grapes that, oh, you can't run your quarterback all that time. I think the Ravens are very well aware this is a pass-happy team typically when you have a different type of quarterback. I, I think it's all about – how, what's the easiest path to win this game? Just protect the ball, run it as much as we can, and if I think we can win in this simple way with our running game and defense. And that's what they saw. I'm sure they're going to see that next week against the Raiders. We know they can keep simple and run Lamar Jackson if they need to and other people, and they're going to win. So I think it's a product of the matchup as well, but just a, a really good uh, game plan there to get your, your quarterback involved, get your much-needed uh, victory without – maybe forcing that evaluation process that you maybe we want to wait till till next year. Give a follow on Twitter at Vinny Iyer of the Sporting News joining us today on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. Vinny, appreciate your time on a Monday night and hope you get to enjoy the Rams Chiefs shootout tonight. All right, thanks and you too. Enjoy it.